Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. Tonight, we're not going to be exploring a specific destination. Rather, we're going to be exp exploring our shared love of travel. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of being your moderator on our travels this evening. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our tour guide for the evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. All right. Thank you, Gabe. And thank you all for joining us on what must be our seventh, uh, maybe our eighth Monday night travel. It is so much fun to be able to get together every Monday night and kind of just celebrate travel. I feel like I'm inviting you into my living room and I feel like you're inviting me into your living room. And I hope you've got your favorite travel partner there and some munchies and something to drink. Maybe that relates to the show. And we're going to be traveling. I want to remind you, this is something we do every Monday night, and uh, next Monday, we're going to go to Ethiopia, and after that, I've still got to lay out the slate for the next month's um, episodes, and I just thought, we've got the, the Q&A widget there, and uh, with every episode, people ask questions. If you have any um, ideas about what you'd like to see us do in the future, I've just been thinking of lots of stuff we could do. I mean, we could we just did shows on Scotland. We could do a show on bloopers. We could do, a, I, I did a talk on Cuba. Uh, we can invite some guests. It'd be fun to get Samantha Brown on with us and sharing. Uh, you could look at our old pilot show back from 1990 if we wanted to. Uh, we could go to festivals. Uh, uh, there's lots of ideas. But if you have any creative ideas about what we might want to feature in future Monday Night Travels, we'd love your feedback. Put that into the Q&A widget. Also, Gabe will be um, curating the questions. And after the show is over, we'll be doing a, just a, a live Q&A. So it's nice to have you there. Uh, uh, we've got our munchies. Let me give you a quick little review of what we've got. First of all, I've got my beer, and this is Chimay. And last time I was in Belgium, I discovered my favorite beer anywhere in Europe. It's Chimay. This is a Trappist monastic beer. There's uh, like 14 different Trappist breweries. And I think Chimay, for me, it's the best. They do four different beers. There's color-coded. There's red, blue, and white Chimay. And then this is the Christmas edition here. It's called Dory Gold. And uh, the uh, this is less, the others are really strong. This is really, this is strong, but the others are really strong. But, you know, if you're a monk, you got to do a lot of, their whole motto is work and pray. Well, if you drink this, you can still work and pray. If you drink the other, you're just going to be sitting there. Uh, but these are very malty. They're, they're, they don't have hops, really. They've got malt. It's a smoky, sweet malt. It's a, This particular one is a seasonal Christmas beer. So it's got lemon and coriander. Just in 2015, Shimei decided to sell some of its uh, beer in the United States. So you can actually get this at your better beer locations. It's expensive beer, but the profit goes to support the charities that the monks work for. So if you like Belgian beers, this is an ale. It's a very sweet sweet, malty beer, and don't miss it when you go to Belgium. And I just love it. And I got to admit or apologize, or I don't know what, but I just, this is, this is a double header. This is the second show and I've been drinking Chimay <laughs> for a couple hours. And also after the, uh, towards the end of the show, I crack into my uh, Croatian and uh, Slovenian uh, fire water. This is a uh, cherry brandy. And I want to give a little episode on that. So we're just traveling. And what we've also got is some cheese. And if you know me, you know I love my cheese. And uh, this is, uh, let's see, Italian, Spanish, Italian, and French. This is, um, this is pecorino. And pecorino is just the Italian word for sheep. So it's like saying sheep cheese, pecorino. And the equivalent in Spain is manchego. So these are the sheep cheeses. I love the gargonzola. The gargonzola is a blue cheese. It's only cow's milk. Creamy, rich, it goes from mild to sharp, as you can imagine, according to how old it is. And this is the Petite Triple Creme. And this is a brie, a French brie, and it's a very, what I call a stinky cheese. I just love it. And um, I'll be munching on that along with my, with my smoked salmon uh, as we go. And uh, I think that kind of gets us settled for our, for our munchies. Now, we're going to do a show right now called Why We Travel. And it's... It's good for a time when we're locked down during this pandemic. Why do we travel? Why is it in our blood, you know? And uh, my producer, Simon, was over here looking at my old journals, and he just was noticing how I just was passionate about travel 
even before I was even a professional travel writer. This is my journal from 1977. I've got nine years of journals before I was actually running my business. And I don't have good penmanship now, but I had, I was pretty, oh, there's Cairo, <laughs> 1977. And uh, well, we've just decided to kind of celebrate the love of travel out of this. And we've got, we're going to be visiting these journals. Uh, the on cameras that you're going to see are either on my deck or at the University of Washington, because this show was done in 2020 and we couldn't go to Europe, but we've woven together beautiful footage from 20 years of an archive of 20 years of TV shows. And the idea is it's a love note to travel. It's a sonnet to travel. In the last year, I've been going, I've been going to several seminaries, actually. I was at Yale Divinity School giving a, a, giving a talk about the road as church. And the road can also be thought of as school. And we're thinking of the road as vacation, school, and church. So right now, we're going to go to Europe, and I'm going to just get the show up. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you enjoy our little half-hour exploration of why we travel. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. After four decades of travel, and with lots more to come, I've been reading my old journals. These go back to the 1970s. I've been reflecting on why I love to travel. Traveling is leaving home, leaving the familiar behind. Why do we do this? Well, to experience new things, to simply have fun and be amazed, to learn, to become students of the world, and for some, like pilgrims, to search for meaning. Join me now as we explore why we travel. So if you've seen the show open in my shows, it's been the same show open for about 100 shows. We uh, spiffed it up here by plugging in some shots of me as a kid when I was in my student Europe through the gutter days of travel. So if you look carefully on that, uh, you can see some shots from when I was a vagabond. The joys of travel are wherever your journey takes you. Peaceful parks, great cities, across the sea, or just across town. Even when we can't travel physically, we can venture out in spirit. Travel is a mindset. Travelers follow their dreams, and mine generally take me to Europe. We travel as tourists to have experiences, to have fun. Going to new places invigorates us. It's exciting. On the road, we get more out of our lives. Seeing our first Michelangelo. Exploring our first castle. Savoring something straight from the sea reaching for high-altitude thrills, being enthralled. Of course, travel is fun, relaxing with abandon, not acting our age, going for broke, joining the party. Travel is also sensual. We see like an artist. We listen like a poet. We taste the unfamiliar. We celebrate with all our senses. Fantastic. Travel heightens our emotions. It makes us really feel <laughs> deeply the beauty, vividly the power, and thoughtfully the humanity. This enhanced experience changes us. It stokes our appetite for life. Travel. Travel. Boy, oh boy. Now, we, we wrote this script before we had any idea of what images we'd put in there. It was a different process this time. 
So we wrote the script. And then when we had the poem written, we had then the challenge of plugging in the right footage from our vast archive of shows, over 100 shows, over 50 hours of TV. So if we had a line like, uh, when we travel, we see like an artist, or we listen like a poet, or we taste the unfamiliar, then we'd go, well, what would be the unfamiliar? Well, maybe that raw herring would work and so on. And with our wonderful, patient, you know, passionate, so talented uh, editor, Steve Camerano, and with Simon, they just hammered this out and we came up with this little um, collection of visual images to support the poem. Our scripts are all collected in a, in a thousand page single word document. So you can, you can type into that bandana and then you can go just to the times we've used the word bandana, you could type in, Botticelli, you could type in foie gras, you could type in Charlemagne, and then you would go right to the clip or right to the part of the script, and then you could find that image and you could put it into the show. We also have a program called Classroom Europe, which is something we've innovated in the last year as a gift to teachers and homeschooling parents. And Classroom Europe takes our 100 shows and breaks them into 500 very quick and easy access, teachable streaming clips between three and five minutes each. And that was really helpful for us because if we wanted to think about Monet, you type in water lilies and bam, you got everything we ever did by Monet in that Classroom Europe script. So that was helpful. Also, as you watch this show, remember along with my voice on the soundtrack, we've got music and we've got what we call sound ups or natural sound. The music is artful. We've already enjoyed the music without even appreciating it probably. It's just always there an unsung hero to the show. And I'll be breaking in a couple of times in the next half hour about the music. And then we didn't have a lot of natural sound in this show, but when Simon brought in the natural sound, it really does a trick. So you'll enjoy that, I hope, as we go through Why We Travel. It's also about people, relationships. We savor conviviality with old friends and with new friends. <laughs> we laugh with abandon. Shared experiences become lifelong memories. My earliest travel experiences, captured on the road decades ago in journals and postcards, remain some of my most treasured memories. The writing kept telling the story of how travel makes the world your friend. June 3rd, 1980, Dingle Peninsula. I really didn't know where I was going. I just stuck out my thumb in whichever direction you want. July 7, York. The evening was spent enchanted in the church, listening to a Bach mass in B minor. A my landlady looked out the window and cheered to me, saying, ah, another day of softness. But I have a strange, almost cocky optimism, a feeling that things will somehow work out for the best. Travel can change our perspective. We discover there's more to life than increasing its speed. As we experience new things, we pause. We reflect. We let the experience breathe. With less hurry, we're able to appreciate nature. To be overwhelmed by it. To notice its power. Its richness. The sweep of the weather. The roar of the river. The freshness of springtime. We notice the light. We savor it. We marvel at the beauty it creates. Every sunset is a devotional, reminding us that life is good. Travel engages us in every sense. This is why we travel. We travel for the experience. 
Ah, we travel for the experience. Writing this script during COVID was really interesting. It's the first year I hadn't been to Europe since I was a kid. Uh, and this was the eighth show of a truncated season. Our season 11 only had eight shows instead of the normal 12. We hoped to go to um, two shows on Poland and two shows on Iceland. We got two great, four great scripts for those. And they'll happen when we get traveling again. But we had a short season. We decided to cap it with this celebration of travel, why we travel. And I was writing from this mindset of being a traveler, exercising the traveler's mindset while at home. You know, I was just walking home. I'll never forget. I saw a snail on my neighbor's fence and all I could think of was escargot. I'm sitting right here at my, this is where I work every day. This is my kitchen table, my dining room table. I saw the sun go down and watching the sun go down, I realized that it's a devotional. It's a beautiful thing. We do that when we travel. We should do it when we're at home. So I was, I was appreciating all the beauty and the joy and the vividness that life is for a traveler and how we can do that at home. And we wanted to put it together in this poem, this love note to travel. In the show, I wanted to give it some kind of a structure. So we have three kinds of travelers. We have the tourist, the traveler, and the pilgrim. And, uh, you know, uh, we've, we've already seen the, the traveler as a tourist. And now we're going to have the uh, as a traveler, you know, we learn and then we will travel to seek. And it makes, you know, the road our playground, the road can be school or the road can be church. <laughs> As travelers, we learn, deepening our understanding of history, art, and culture, we better appreciate those who came before us. And it helps us to better prepare for and contribute to what's next. Gaining context and perspective, we become wiser. Wherever we travel, we see reminders of our collective past. History speaks. Travelers listen. And we learn. We appreciate the long march of human progress. Great civilizations arc. They rise. They peak. and they fall. We're inspired by their achievements, the ancient foundations of our own society. Prehistoric pagans, mysteries still held in their megalithic wonders. The Egyptians, with the extravagance of their art and the immensity of their architecture. The Greeks, whose magnificent temples and passion for bringing gods to earth, established what became a standard for beauty. And the Romans, whose empire taught the West how to organize society to engineer, inspiring those who followed to build big and dream bigger. Oh, yeah. Well, she may. I, I would really recommend going to Belgium in your travels. And in Belgium, part of your cultural experience is the beer. There's nothing like these Belgian beers. They're not a refreshing kind of lager or a Pilsner you'll find in Czech Republic or, or Bavaria. But this wonderful malty, milkshakey, sweet, monk-made beer. And to drink it in Belgium is just amazing. And Bruges, put that on your checklist. Okay. It was such a challenge for me in this show not to identify all the things we just saw. We just morphed from the Pantheon in Rome to Brunelleschi's Dome in Florence. Wouldn't it be nice to say that on the screen or in the script? Nope. 
we wanted it just to be the images and the ideas without the specifics. And it was sort of a freedom to do that. But at the same time, I needed as a tour guide to have those specifics somewhere. So in every one of our shows, by the way, you can see all of our shows for free anytime without me hitting the pause button, of course, including this show. If you go to ricksteves.com, go to the TV section. I feel like I'm talking funny. I don't know what it is, but uh, I guess I'm just thirsty. Um, go to the TV section and um, you'll find there a list of all 100 shows. And then you can click on that show and you can watch it and you can have the script and any sort of travel tips because if it's featured in the show, we give you the travel tips, the, the hotel or the restaurant we went to or whatever. And in this show, it's the only show we do this, we give you an entire shot list. Everything we see in the show is listed, tied in with the script so you know what you're looking at. So if you'd like to see what all of these, if you see something in the show that you just got, I want to go there, uh, it'd be cruel not for us, for us not to tell you, but you can go to ricksteves.com and check that out. And I do want to remind you, all the shows are available anytime for free without pausing on our YouTube station, uh, our channel. We've got over well over a million people now who are subscribing to our YouTube channel because there's so much great video there and at ricksteves.com. Also, this script is different because it's not as wordy. It's not as dense. Normally, we put in 3,000 words in a half hour script. This show has 2,000 words, lots of time to breathe. It's kind of therapeutic to just let it soak in, enjoy it. Don't talk so much. And 95% of the uh, video images you're seeing here were shot by two guys, our lead cameraman, Peter Rummel and Carl Bauer. Those guys are just great. I'm so thankful for the crew I've got to make these shows and for public broadcasting to let us share it with our entire country. Travelers trace the progress out of ancient times through the ages, as if enjoying an epic play. Fear and feudalism, pillage, and plagues, sacred monarchs, profane popes. We witness the birth of our modern age, the age of enlightenment, that spark that lit the age of revolution. Then, with the rise of the masses, the fall of kings. History teaches us that evil also plays a role in the human story. That the struggle for justice, for liberty, for democracy has always been expensive. Horrific wars, so many dead. We mourn the losses. We celebrate the victories. We honor the cost of freedom. Travelers learn to appreciate the past as if they actually lived it. We marvel at glitter and gilding, dazzled as if duped by a king's propaganda. We gape through a dome, as if it actually does connect mortals with the gods. And we gaze at the divine, like an illiterate peasant filled with fear and faith. My journals capture how travel was becoming my teacher and the road was my school. August 7, 1983, Hexham. We spent an exciting hour climbing along Hadrian's Wall, built by the Romans 2,000 years ago as August the northernmost border Santorini. of It was a small boat. I felt quite safe, but said several prayers by, by a 74-year-old man on the piazza. He had more enthusiasm for life Berlin. and respect for I the world. I idealism history. matures into realism as you wander through your 20s but I find I've made a surprising turn. Each chapter of the human story has been interpreted by the genius of artists, illustrating our story, expressing it more deeply than mere words. From the primitive beauty of pigment on rock 
to the canvas of a master. Familiar stories told and retold. One age speaking to the next. Medieval, Renaissance, modern. Art heralds our progress, the leap from medieval to modern. Humanism, showing the human body as beautiful. The human spirit as powerful, confident, a worthy child of God. And humankind, you and me rather than the divine, as the shaper of destinies. I was just caught up in that for a moment there. Ha! <laughs> All the beautiful art and being able to be there. That's one of the challenges of a good guide is to help people go back in time and to appreciate something, not looking at it from some modern person in 2020, but looking at it through a 16th century viewpoint to understand it in its own terms, in its own context, what was going on. Because these people are just like you and me. They're making a difference. They're caring people. They're engaged. They're just having a different window of time for their lives. Um, everything I know about all this art, it seems like virtually everything I share, I picked up by hiring local guides, following them around these great sites and letting them teach me. That's what my guides do on a Rick Steves tour. We have a hundred guides like that. And our mission, our passion, our dream is to help people get caught up in the art. Just like a lot of us may have been in the last couple of seconds watching these shows. These are real people. <laughs> they just lived 500 years ago. And we can better get into what was going on if we understand the historic context, what was happening back then. By the way, we had so much fun putting this together. It makes me really confident in our next project. We've just embarked on our next project, which I'm very excited about. And it's going to be a, a, a big, giant project. It's going to be a six-hour series of the story of Europe through its art, from the Parthenon all the way to Picasso, drawing from all the footage we've made over 100 episodes and going back to Europe to lace it all together. And with the fun we had with this and with the richness of our archive and the joy we get in teaching the art with our experience as tour guides on all of our Rick Steves bus tours, it's gonna to be a cool series. So stay tuned, a little less than two years from now, we're gonna debut another series. Thanks again to public television, the one place on the dial, as I like to say, that respects your intelligence, that assumes an attention span and brings you programming driven not by a passion for keeping advertisers happy, but simply by a passion for inspiring us to reach out there and embrace this beautiful world in all its diversity. That's public broadcasting. That's travel. And we've got a lot to be thankful for it. Art captures sorrow, the heartbreak of tragedy, the true cost of war. It gives voice to tears. Art captures triumph. The statue that faced the darkness and declared, I can do this, we can do this. The people who demanded freedom for all. It speaks truth to power. Art proclaims faith. Frescoes painted as a form of prayer. A crucifix painted as the artist wept. And art proclaims joy. Timeless joys. The love of life. The love of love. Oh. Gustav Klimt, the love of love, and the love of Gorgonzola. Gorgonzola, it's, it's the Italian version of blue cheese, I guess. And I've been enjoying my sheep cheese. The, as I mentioned, Pecorino is sheep in Italian. Manchego is sheep in Espanol. And then I've always liked my stinky French cheese. But the Italian Gorgonzola is just 
just amazing. Hey, the next two clips, glorious music. One is at the Salzburg Cathedral at the Christmas Mass, and the other is the Norwegian Girls Choir, Candlelit. And the music clips we've got coming up are thanks to a lot of our specials, which happen to be heavy in music. And as you look at this next music section, appreciate the artistry of Steve Camerano, our editor, and Simon Griffith, our producer. And it all is woven together like a medley, the rhythm, the music, the beat, even my voice, it's all fit together as if it was meant to be. It's not accidental. It happens because of Steve Camerano, our editor. Music is art. It speaks to our soul. When we sing, we pray double. And from the street, to the pubs. To concert halls. To cathedrals. Music pulls out all the stops. Dance is art. Art in motion. It speaks to the heart. It keeps tradition alive. It ignites our passions. And architecture is art as well. Ornate palaces stoking royal egos. Grand entries and gardens fit for a king. Fortresses of faith built by people knowing they'd never see them finished. Arches holding sacred stories carved in stone. Spires reaching for the heavens. Look at that view. That's the Chartres Cathedral. I like this view because that's the view a pilgrim would have seen 600 years ago. Chartres was a great uh, pilgrim's destination. There was a, a veil uh, that I think that was, uh, I think it was the veil on Jesus uh, when he was taken out from the cross, but it was a, um, a, a relic and it survived in a fire and uh, it brought a lot of money. So they built this fantastic church and people from all over the place went to see it. And I always dream what it'd be like to be a pilgrim walking and trekking for weeks. And then on the horizon, there's no big buildings except for the church. And there you see, those spires reaching up to heaven. That's the marker. You don't need a map now. You see where you're going. And I'm really thankful that my producer, Simon, um, indulges me. When I've got a certain image I want to get in the show, we'll take the time it takes. We drove a long time to find the right angle from our car so we can see the pilgrim's view of Shard Cathedral from a distance. Sometimes it doesn't work, but Simon always lets me try. And this one works beautiful. I just love this last way to cap church architecture. In this next bit, we're talking about blending in. And notice how my wardrobe in, in like four spots in a row actually blends in also. I mean, it's black, then it's burgundy, then it's purple, then it's blue. Certainly we didn't plan it that way, but it just worked out. And it's a reminder, if you can blend in, not just by the color of your shirt, your travels will go much, much better. Travelers learn that art and history mix and meld into culture we learn to value the importance of culture. Like cultural chameleons, we blend in. We join in. Relishing the differences. Enjoying the similarities. Nice. 
nice, huh? And everyone celebrates the town square. Der Platz, La Plaza, La Piazza. It's on the road that we learn that every culture has a soul. It's the combination of the art, the history, and the people that creates that soul. <laughs> this is why we travel. We travel to learn, to touch that soul. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those sound ups I just love. By the way, remember, uh, you can watch this show without the pausing if you go to YouTube or ricksteves.com and watch the show without interruptions. Also remember, we're gonna be answering questions after the show's over, so pop in a question if you like into that widget. And if you'd like to give us some ideas on some topic you'd like us to explore in a Monday night travel, let us know with a comment in the Q&A widget right now. Up next is the pilgrims part of the travel. And as I mentioned, the road can be school, the road can be vacation, and the road can be church. And it's so important, I have found, that regardless of if you go to church or not, that you just recognize that being away from home, embracing new ways of living, looking at home from a distance, we learn so much and we can also get close to God. And it's a beautiful thing to realize if you, if you believe in God, that we're all children of God. And that means travel is a beautiful way to get to know the family. On the road, like pilgrims, we can become seekers. Even in this age of unprecedented abundance, many of us hunger for something more, for meaning. By leaving home, we learn more about home more about ourselves. We pause, reflect, and hope to grow. Throughout the ages, people have looked beyond the physical world to get close to God or some heavenly creator. To ask the eternal questions. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where will we go? It's always been a mystery. Fertility. Abundance. The cycle of life. The promise of something after we die. We sing. We perform rituals. We celebrate. We sit with someone of a different faith and accept their love. I, I love you. I love him. I love everybody. We go to war, often mixing up love and fear. Pawns of the powerful, killing often in the name of God. We struggle to understand. We trust, or at least hope, someone up there is listening. Whether religious or not, Travelers can learn from the holy books of the great monotheistic faiths, each the story of refugees and nomads, of pilgrims and travelers. In the Torah, the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness. In the Bible, Jesus' disciples left home and set out to share their good news. In the Quran, Muhammad said, don't tell me how educated you are, tell me how much you've traveled. These holy scriptures are the stories of travelers. Lessons from those for whom the road was church, synagogue, or mosque. People who traveled to find something bigger. Pilgrims trek today. Some to get close to God. others to better understand themselves. My journals have helped me reflect on how being small is actually being big, how being alone is actually being connected. 
June 30, 1980, the Schilthorn. I hiked out, only a little afraid, past the top of a snowfield and onto the tip of a nearby peak, where I felt very close to God. Needing some alone time, I snuck out to a remote spot beyond the temple, and among broken Roman columns, just got wind blown beach, in strolled, lovely solitude, and then sat on a stone throne. A bit cold, loving the silence, I thought, Nobody knows where I am. Here's to good wine and good family. Mm. Traveling makes us appreciate. Appreciate what we have rather than what we don't have. Savoring the luxury of a simple meal. Embracing solitude. Valuing each summit earned. Religious or not, we count our blessings. Blessings of plenty, of stability and community, of family bonds, and deep friendships. Why do I see humanity as one? Because I've traveled. So now we're coming into a part of the program where we're using Europe as a springboard for traveling and venturing beyond Europe. And uh, it is really just so, such a beautiful thing to think that Europe is your entree to world travel. And thanks to our footage that we have from doing shows in Ethiopia, Guatemala, Iran, the Holy Land, and so on, we had a lot of footage to draw from for that. And that let our show open up. I do wanna remind you, some of these clips are from Ethiopia and a week from tonight, we'll be going to Ethiopia together on the next edition of Monday Night Travel. Why am I curious? In spite of my privilege, why do I care? Because I've traveled. Why am I grateful? And why do I want to contribute? Because I've traveled. This is why we travel and why we keep traveling. Through traveling, we find meaning. By traveling thoughtfully, we connect. Even for those of us who can only travel as a state of mind, travel can result in a deeper connection. Travel connects us face to face with reality. It's not virtual. It's not through a viewfinder. Travel is candid, honest, being in the moment. Thank you. In a world hungry for authenticity, we yearn for connection. But now she's quite big. She's like you, about like that, yeah. Travelers connect with different cultures, different people. On the road, strangers are just friends we've yet to meet. Travel frees us from routine. It creates room for serendipity. Okay, so now I'm ready to be a shepherd. This is serendipity leads to connections. Travel forces us to bend and to flex. It makes us more tolerant and inspires us to celebrate diversity. The lessons I've gained from exploring Europe, the land of my heritage, are universal. For me, these lessons are affirmed and then stretched when traveling further afield. As a child ventures beyond his backyard, I like this shot. It shows me and my buddy Gene the day after we graduated from high school, back in 73, heading off to Europe. We have the biggest backpacks money could buy, and we worked very hard to fill them up. We had, we're like we're going on a Boy Scout hiking adventure. We have mess kits, we have tube tents, we have squeeze tubes with peanut butter and jam. I've got a metal tin on top of my thing there filled with guidebooks, and uh, we just were terrible packers, but it was our best trip ever. And uh, so many years later, I'm still working with Gene. He's my uh, co-author on a lot of my most, uh, my, my, my favorite books. Uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of photographs from those days. It's funny, people didn't photograph a lot, but, but we got a couple of shots that we were able to use here. Also, we did some, we dug in and found some very old footage. And if you ever see video footage, that's what we call square, it's four by three. That's from before the year 2000, basically, from the 20th century. And anything that is nine by 16, that's the, what you're looking at right now. That's the, 
That's the, the natural periphery, sort of the shape of what we look at through our eyes. And that's the modern way of looking at video. But we have a couple of um, video images that are from the last century that would be that square version of the formatting. I ventured beyond Europe. Year after year, I pushed my boundaries. The world opened wide with a montage of wonders and lessons learned. Traveling beyond my comfort zone, culture shock became constructive. The growing pains of a broadening perspective, my ethnocentrism challenged. The celebration of difference and oneness at the same time. The recognition that love is love in their home just as in mine. I think this is a beautiful, beautiful welcome here. Through travel, we see a world filled with joy, with compassion, and with good people. We learn the more we reach out, the more we receive. We learn that we all share the same world. Nice. And we all share the same window of time. Travelers seek bridges rather than walls. Every wall has two sides and two narratives. For one to be truly understood, both must be heard. Traveling, we realize the challenges of our future will be blind to borders and best overcome not by conflict and walls, but by community and bridges. There's so much fear these days. The flip side of fear, it's understanding. And we gain understanding when we travel. What is it? The celebration of it's a celebration when we come together. You know, there's this whole theme that I've been thinking about lately, bridges or walls. And politically, our country has been in a big discussion about walls. And frankly, it breaks my heart to think of the billions of dollars we've spent building a wall, when if we wanted to be safe and stable, we could have redirected that money into helping people live dignified lives south of the border and have reason to stay at home instead of trying to get into a country that had more, more wealth and security. This is the opportunity we have in our travels to learn the value of building bridges. I just love building bridges. <sighs> I could talk and talk about that, but I won't. But I'll remind you at the end of the show right now, we're just wrapping it up. I wanted to have somewhere, I wanted to have a face montage. It's what I, uh, one of my favorite things that we do. It's just a whole collection of local faces because it's people that really is the, the pithy beauty of travel, connecting with people. And we decided at the very end, no bloopers. Instead, we'll just have a face montage. And, and we decided just to do one country. We chose Romania, but it could have been any country. But as you look at those faces, remember, they represent the humanity of one country. And then you multiply that by a couple hundred, and you get a bit of, an, of a sense of the wonderful diversity on this planet and the joy we get when we get to know it. Travel is more than a holiday. It gives us new experiences, acts as our greatest teacher, makes our lives more meaningful, and connects us with a global family. We can't all travel physically, but anyone can live with a traveler's mindset. It's a choice. Travel makes us more comfortable with the world, our hearts bigger, and our lives richer. And it makes us happier. And that is why we travel. Ah, and to end it with such a beautiful Romanian kiss. Ah, oh, I just love the way we're able to collect, connect those faces, because again, that's why we travel. I hope you've enjoyed why we travel. As I was watching that, it occurred to me, you know, we're a business and uh, we have to produce. And what we produce, our mission is the appetite for Americans to reach out and the information so that they can do it smartly and safely. That's our profit. How many perspectives can we help broaden through travel? And because of that, we make money and we're a viable business. But our mission is fundamentally 
to inspire Americans to reach out to venture beyond Orlando. And this year, of course, we've been making no money at all because nobody's taking our bus tours and almost nobody's buying our guidebooks. But with our TV work, with our radio work, with the information on our website, with our teaching, I believe we are still inspiring Americans to be open to the rest of the world, to be more tuned into building bridges and less into building walls. And for that reason, 2020 has been a profitable year for us. 2021, we might make some money at the same time. Again, on a normal year, we take a lot of people on our trips, but this year, we're taking a lot of people on travels vicariously. And we sure enjoy these Monday night travel events because it's our chance to get together with you and to celebrate travel. And right now, we're going to do Q&A, but I'm going to just remind you, I was going to try some of this, uh, ah, rakia. And one of the joys for me as a tour operator is I get to invite all of my European friends who are guides over. We had 100 people in this living room almost exactly one year ago. It was like, it was, it was in early, it was in uh, January of this year. And um, my guides bring me presents. And this is from Slovenia. And this is the, oh, it's, it's cherry schnapps, basically, cherry brandy. And uh, I, I just was looking through my gifts. And my friends from Slovenia brought me this tube and it has all of these um, little packages. And just today, I was, as I was preparing for this, I thought, oh my goodness, this is a drink. This is a shot of brandy. And I know this word here, it's cherry, vishna. So this is cherry, um, cherry schnapps. And I'm just going to pour it in my beautiful crystal from Dingle in Ireland. Oh, there we go. And I'm not even sure how good this is going to be. But just for all of your pleasure, I'm going to see if it's any good. Oh, baby. Yeah. <laughs> this takes me to Croatia. When you travel in former Yugoslavia, anywhere in the Baltics, in Greece, in Turkey, you'll be tempted with the local fire water. It's called Raki or Rakia. Hey, let's go um, back to Gabe and see if we can answer some questions. All right. Thank you so much, Rick, um, for that tour through our love of travel. Um, and I'm wondering if before we get to questions, if we can get a word from our sponsor for this week. Our sponsor for this week, Vishna Jevika, Rakia from Slovenia. <laughs> no, our, our sponsor is Rick Steves Europe. And that's a uh, hundred hardworking travelers. It's you, me and 98 other people, Gabe. And um, we're staying, our, keeping our team together. We're working hard and we're excited about helping people, Americans, put their travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality when we are free to travel again. And uh, we've got our tours uh, booked. We've got tours ready to go. We got people on the wait list. Uh, our best year ever was a year ago, 2019. And we took 30,000 people on 1,200 different tours. This was our catalog for this year. And we printed this up and mailed them out. And we had 24,000 people signed up on tours for this year. And suddenly, bam, all gone. So we had to give all those uh, deposits back. But we've got 2021. It's essentially the same thing. Uh, and it is for next year. And it's 40 different itineraries. These are just great itineraries. I'm so proud of the work my staff does with our tour program. And we're not making a printed version, it's a PDF, but anybody can go to ricksteves.com and download that PDF or just read about it on our website in the tour section. I also wanna remind you that we're not taking people's deposits because we don't know when we can travel again, but we are fairly confident we'll be able to get things throttled up in the fall of 2021. Uh, we're hopeful, we have a government that believes in science, We've got vaccines on the way, and I think we're on a glide path to normalcy. And I'll tell you, you know, social distancing and Rick Steves style travel have almost nothing to do with each other. I don't want to jump the gun. I don't want to be the first over there and go to Amsterdam and eat dinner in a bubble so nobody's, I get nobody's germs. It's going to get back to normal where we can connect with Europeans, and that's what we're going to do. We're not going to start our tour program until we can do that responsibly. And we think that'll be late 2021. So we're glad in the meantime to be staying together, to be teaching, to be making content, to be investing in our infrastructure. And when people go to our travel site now at ricksteves.com, if they go to the tour department, we're not selling our tours. We're connecting our travelers with our guides in Europe who are looking to make a little money or just to share their teaching. It's called the Guides Marketplace. And we curate it every week with a wonderful favorites of the marketplace. 
We must have 40 or 50 guides doing creative things. Most of it is free. And it's a wonderful way for our travelers to stay in touch with our guides and just to let the guides celebrate the teaching and the culture they love so much. Cooking classes, art classes, language classes, uh, virtual tours, you name it. You name it. It is at ricksteves.com in the tours section. So that's the ad for today, Gabe, and let's answer some questions. All right, our first question comes from Laura, and she was wondering if you still get souvenirs while you travel, um, or you know how you keep your memories from your travels. Oh, baby, this is a memory right here. <laughs> the memories are having a drink with people you meet on the road. That's really the memories. And um, I, I stopped doing any kind of physical souvenirs after I got my Rome and my Florence bottle openers. Okay, I just I just not into souvenirs. So I um, I take photographs and I collect memories. That's what I do. So I think that's the magic. And my favorite souvenir, as I like to say when I teach my classes, is a broader perspective. That's what I want to bring home and empathy for the other ninety six percent of humanity. Of course, that's somebody who's been to Europe thirty hundred 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 days a year for the last forty years. Uh, if it was my first trip to Europe, I'd probably buy, you know, some uh, you know, little felt hat with, with feathers in it and uh, a, a little bowl with uh, pickle pickle skewers in it. And uh, uh, I don't know, a pewter Viking ship when I was in Norway and a cuckoo clock when I'm in the Black Forest, but I'm beyond that now. Um, and I know that for you, um, Rick, also a big souvenir is your journals. Um, and Mark was wondering if if there would ever be a time that you would ever publish any of those old journals or past musings. I am so, these have been hiding away in my closet, Mark. I honestly, I just love to show it off because I was a freak. I'm, an, I'm a 20 year old kid, not going out to bars at night, but writing this thing. And it's, everyone is written. And in the back, it's filled with all sorts of, um, you know, data. I mean, words I learned every day, whatever youth hostel cost me and so on. And yeah, it's a, I, if people would find it interesting, and I'm in a process right now with our book staff in exploring these journals and seeing if there's something that would be interesting to share. I have a hunch there is, because I was just diligently taking, if nothing else, I'll uncover memories that I'll be able to uh, capitalize on in my teaching, but I'd like to do something. So stay tuned for that. Um, Rick Todd was also wondering if there is any specific thing that kind of gave you the travel bug and um, why you've decided to focus mostly on Europe. Yeah. Back when I was a kid, there was a TV series called Roots. Everybody was going for their roots. They wanted to see their name on a tombstone. I could care less to see my name on a tombstone, but I wanted to find my cultural roots, which happened to be European. Uh, and I love history. I got a European history degree just accidentally when I was at the UW. I just enjoyed it. Uh, so I find uh, going back to Europe is just natural for me. It's my family roots. It's, uh, it's the history that I know. Um, but uh, my favorite countries are beyond Europe. I mean, India, Indonesia, Thailand, Japan, or my um, Sri Lanka, Nepal. These are a lot of my, my favorite countries. But in my work and in my life, I've focused on how can I help the most people and where can I do the best job? and it's the biggest market and it's what I know best. And I've decided to stay focused on Europe as the springboard for world exploration. Uh, but what got me excited about it, I think was just the fun I had as a kid over there. The first time I went to Europe without my parents, it was like, look out world, here I come. And uh, as a kid, I, I wish I was still poor and able to take big risks because <laughs> those were the best trips. Um, but we all get more, more cautious and more comfortable with age, I think. But if you've got a chance to have that, that uh, Europe through the gutter experience when, when you're a kid before you're settled down as an adult, I think it's a great, great thing to be able to do. Rick, Angela was also wondering, after all of these months at home, which is very new for you, um, has your perspective on why you travel changed at all during this quarantine? You know, my... That's this whole show we just watched was an exercise in why we travel. Simon and I came up with the name before we had the script. Why do we travel? And then I collected all my thoughts about why I travel. I meditated on it. I just did anything I could to help me get different angles on that. And I collected all this information. And if somebody is serious about that question, 
I would think they would just go to our website and read the script of what they just saw and just think of it as a poem. But um, there's a lot of reasons to travel. And I think the enlightened traveler goes beyond the bucket list travel. For me, I don't, I'm not rude enough to tell somebody I, I, I don't respect your bucket, your, how many countries you've been in in your bucket list because it's not a matter of ticking the boxes. If somebody tells me I've been to 85 countries, how many have you been to? I tell them I've never counted. I, it means nothing. You, you may have been to 85 airports. How many friends did you make? How many preconceptions did you change? How many, how many opportunities did you embrace when you could reassess something you thought was self-evident and God-given? Those are the real accomplishments. And that's what I've been able to do. To go to India and to find that it's filled with joy instead of filled with misery. India is one of the most joyful places I've ever had the privilege of traveling. You know, to, to, go to, to go to Latin America. My son lives in Colombia, in South America. <laughs> Why? Because he loves Colombian culture. And I went down there a year ago today. I was in Colombia with my son. And I understood how my son is so enamored with Colombian culture in South America. Uh, in the way I'm enamored with Italian culture or Turkish culture or Indian culture or my favorite place to eat in the world, Japan. Uh, the world is a playground. And for somebody to never have the curiosity to bother to venture beyond Orlando, um, it's not, it doesn't impress me very much. It's a lost opportunity. Building on that, Rick, Harjad was wondering, um, what is one of your most memorable experiences with a stranger while traveling or a friend that you had yet to meet? Huh. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, I'm just thinking through a lot of them. <laughs> You can always think about it and we can get back to you next. I'm not, I, I can't say my favorite one. I can tell you, you know, I, I've got, I wasn't planning on advertising this one tonight, but For the Love of Europe is a 400 page collection of my favorite experiences, my favorite people and places. I mean, shaking hands with a man with a deformed hand, a little finger twice as fat as mine because he spent his lifetime playing the carillon in the church tower like this. That's how you play the keyboard of a carillon with a clenched fist. And that builds up massive calluses here. And then to be invited to his concert and to enjoy it. And then to see him stick his head out of the tower at the end of the concert at 10 o'clock at night in Bruges and wave his funny hand at me. That was just really great. Um, to visit a, a bed and breakfast in Dubrovnik with a man whose house was bombed a few years earlier and he rebuilt it. And he's still got a piece of the mortar, the mangled mortar that blew up his family home. And today he's rebuilt that house and he welcomes the children of the people who launched that mortar as guests in his b, &B to celebrate how far former Yugoslavia has come and weaving itself together after its tragic war. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. To be with a guide in Gibraltar and have him take me to the top of the rock of the Gibraltar and to sit on that rock and for him to tell me, this is the only place on earth where you can see two continents and two seas at the same time, Africa and Europe, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. And when you think about the Mediterranean and Atlantic coming together, you got all that chop, all those tide rips, all that food brought together, all the little fish, all, this, all the seagulls eating the little fish and the big fish that come. And then the trawlers and the human beings that are catching those big fish and all the danger from that confused sea and all the riches from all that food brought together by two bodies of water coming this way. And then to think of the two cultures coming together this way, not Africa and Europe, but Islam and Christendom coming together and all of the overlap and here come the Moors and here come the Germans and all of this stuff. And then to go to a church where you go in the church and you have a guy on a horse named St. James the Moor Killer and he's got his sword up in the air and at the foot of his horse are the heads of all the Muslims. He's cut off their heads and he's worshiped in that church as a great saint. And then to realize that that church was built on the rubble of a destroyed mosque, which was built on the rubble of a destroyed church, which was built on the rubble of a destroyed Roman temple, which was probably built on a holy ground before that Roman temple. 
all right there where those two continents and those two seas come together. And to sit on top of that rock of Gibraltar with this beautiful guide and just to be turned on to all of that fascinating, thoughtful appreciation of the wonderful complexity of our world. You know, that happens everywhere you go. If you reach out and you bring some context with you and you put yourself in touch with people who know how to share it. That's why we're so excited about, you know, finding the best guides in Europe and connecting them with the most eager and curious tourists. It's a beautiful, beautiful mission that we have at Rick Steves Europe. All right, Rick. Um, we will do two more questions. Um, one question, Julie is wondering how you grapple with the environmental impact of travel um, and how you um, plan to contribute to the solution for that. Yeah, well, that's very important. Let me finish my Rocky here. <laughs> Anybody who travels is contributing to climate change. That's the existential challenge of our future as a race, I believe. I'm just saying what I believe. Anybody who organizes travel contributes even more. We took 30,000 people last year around Europe, made a lot of money, made more money than we should have because we were not paying for our carbon. So last year we innovated a new program. It's a self-imposed carbon tax. I did a lot of study on this. It takes $30 smartly invested to mitigate the carbon you or I take when we fly to Europe and back. $30 invested smartly in carbon offsets or any number of things mitigates the carbon you create. It doesn't make you a hero. It just makes you ethical, okay? So as a businessman, I thought I should be paying $30 per person I take to Europe. It should be a cost of goods sold. But our government doesn't believe in that kind of ethic because it's not good for sh short-term profit statements and short-term corporate profits is what motivates our country, even if it's not sustainable, and even if it could pave the way to our collective doom, you know, but it's just not in the card. So we have to do it as ethical business people. So we took 30,000 people times $30, that's $900,000. We rounded it up to $1 million and we gave $1 million to 10 different organizations working to fight climate change. And in doing so, we mitigated the carbon we created. Does that make us heroic? No, it just makes us ethical. We flew to Europe and back mitigating. You can flight shame people out of their travels, but I don't think that accomplishes a lot. You can travel as long as ethically, as long as you pay your way. What we invested in, we the conventional thing for a businessman would have be would have been investing in carbon offsets, and I looked into that, and it just didn't turn me on. We and uh, uh, lots of scientific estimates, and I've read enough about it where there, it seems really clear to me. You can invest in developing world farmers. Half of humanity is trying to live on $5 a day running little farms, mom and pop farms. And they work really hard and they struggle and they contribute a lot to climate change with the carbon they produce and the deforestation they cause, which is all sorts of problem, bad news. By investing in them, giving them what they call climate smart agriculture techniques, they are able to do their work, produce more and contribute less to climate change. But they need help from the, the developed world uh, to get that done. So we, put an average of $100,000 into 10 organizations helping uh, 10 different societies in the developing world with their farmers contribute less to deforestation and less to climate change with the carbon they produce. It's fascinating. And it, we just did a report. It's on our website. You can check it out, giving uh, an example of what a million dollars smartly invested in these kind of nonprofit organizations can do to mitigate climate change. And we didn't have, it's based on how many people we take to Europe. This year we took nobody to Europe, but we're so excited about the progress we made in 2019 that we decided we're gonna pay half of what we would have paid had we done our business this year anyway. So we've just chosen 10 more organizations that we're giving $500,000 to, $50,000 each on average. And it's exciting the work they're doing. So if you go to ricksteves.com and you look in the climate smart initiative section, you can find it easily. Just look for the climate change stuff. Um, it starts off by saying, steal this program and do not credit us. Everybody should be using this who's in the tourist business. And consumers, I think, should favor companies that let them travel with an ethical climate smart way. And they should, um, I think, not favor organizations that don't pay their way because it is horrible what tourism is doing along with a lot of other industries to contribute to climate change and i want my grandkids get on the ball andy and jackie i want my grandkids to enjoy travel but unless we get on the stick now and start getting ethical about it we're not going to be traveling two generations from now that would break my heart 
So long-winded answer, but you asked a complicated question. Uh, one, one more question. Our last question, Rick. I know we've asked you a few times where you want to go when travel's possible again, but I thought um, Jennifer asked a good question of what's, what's a place that you've never been to before that you most want to go to when travel is possible again? I want to go to a lot of places. I want to go to the South Pacific. If I, if I was just going to be selfish, I want to go to the South Pacific. I've never been there. I'd like to get a better appreciation of South America. I'd like to get a better appreciation of deep Eastern Europe, the Ukraine, Georgia, Russia. I just got, I just talked um, with one of our guides in St. Petersburg in Russia. I'm dying to go to St. Petersburg and make a TV show. I'd love to do that. Um, so, but the South Pacific is what I dream to do. Will I go there? Somebody could give me an all expenses paid trip to a luxurious resort in Fiji for 10 days. And I would probably say, thank you so much. I'd love to go, but I need to go to Portugal and work on my guidebook. I just love our work so much. And we, we care about our mission so much that I'm committed um, for the foreseeable future into just making sure we're doing Europe as best we can. So those who use Rick Steves guidebooks and tours will have the best possible trip. Hey, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. I just, I'm, this is so much fun. And uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, why we travel. Next week is going to be Ethiopia. And after that, we've got lots of Monday night travel. So uh, stay tuned and happy travels to all of you, even if we're just staying home for a while and happy New Year's. I got a great feeling about 2021. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening and happy new year.